Well, good morning. Once again, there are more people here than I was expecting on a Sunday where we lost an hour of sleep. You guys are the faithful. You are the holy crowd. Watch us stand with us. We're just going to dive on in this morning. We have a God who is eager to spend time with us this morning. We shouldn't keep him waiting. Sing this with us. God, my Savior. God, my Savior.
Just, just do that. <laughs> Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of John. We're looking in chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. Hear these words this morning. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves. The money changers seated at their table, making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up? in three days, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This church is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks. Thanks. It's now time for this morning's offering. We'll invite the ushers to come forward. As the basket passes you by, please stand and join us in worship.
don't really have any words for what you've done, for who you are, for what you are. God, we, we sing that line until he returns and call me home. We sing it over and over again because there is hope and there is strength and there is comfort in believing that you will return to this earth one day and claim that which is yours. That's us today. You created us. You redeemed us. You sustained us. And one day you will call us home. We are encouraged by that. We are blessed by that. And we know that there's a lot to do here on earth while we still live. So we pray that you would speak to us from your word now and challenge us to go forward. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say. Amen. 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 The text this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Uh, this is Paul telling the story of the cross to a group of people who don't understand why a sign of death is a sign of life. I'll hear these words this morning. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will ward. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this great age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs. And Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. This church is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Saints of Orange. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. It's good, good to be seen. seen. It is good to be seen. I'm glad you set your clocks for uh, Some of us a little, little uh, later in that than, than we probably should have been on the elbows last night. But we all got here, so thank God for that. Uh, tonight, the Learning Channel marks uh, the beginning of a new season of a show they have on their entitled who do you think you are? Uh, on the show, with the help of professional genealogists, featured celebrities spend an intense amount of time researching their family history. In research, a lot of times they'll find uh, surprising truths about their family, some good, some not so good. Regardless, as those who who have been determined or have been regarded by the roles that they play and the public persona they present. I think this particular show serves a worthwhile function of helping these celebrities reconnect to their roots, help them to recover their identity. This need to recover identity and reconnect to roots is not limited to the glitterati. Indeed, there are certainly institutions within our culture that are adrift this morning from their true moorings. Sailing on a sea of ambivalence, being tossed by the ever-changing tide of popular opinion. Peter Greer and Chris Horst in their books, Mission Drift, lifts up one such institution as an example. It's one of the highest regarded institutions of public knowledge or information and intelligence in our culture. Harvard University. Harvard was founded in 1636, and as part of their founding mission statement, this phrase was part of the mission statement. The end goal of our studies and the lives of our students is to know God and Jesus Christ. Harvard University. At one time, Harvard hired only Christian professors. They were intensely interested in building character in the lives of their students. And above all, they were committed to the task of preparing young men for the pro 
proclamation of the gospel. Flash forward some 380 years, and Harvard still has a very intact, high academic reputation. But something seems to have been lost in the translation. <clears throat> Former president of Harvard University, Larry Summer, was reported as saying, things divine certainly have been no part of my professional nor my personal life. At one time, Harvard's purpose, its mission was crystal clear. Academic excellence, Christian formation. But somewhere along the way, Harvard lost touch with their roots. They lost their sense of identity. Now, there's a very important lesson in all of this for us as individual disciples and as a church this morning. We need to understand that mission and vision are deeply rooted in and inextricably tied with identity. Mission and vision are linked with identity. If we do not know who we are, if we do not know that in which we are grounded, then we are going to struggle mightily and fail ultimately in trying to fulfill any sense of mission or vision. And the truth of the matter is we have to admit this morning that as individual disciples and as a church, there, is, there are times in our lives, in everyday life, when we find ourselves adrift, being blown to and fro by every wind of doctrine, unsure of our footing, of our true purpose. But I'm here to tell you there's good news this morning, and it is good news. The good news is we are able to remember who we are. We are able to recover our identity. And that comes to us not courtesy of a show on the Learning Channel. It comes to us as a result of this Lenten journey upon which we find ourselves traveling this day. The journey from transfiguration to the triumphal entry in Jerusalem, to the upper room, to the hill called Golgotha, and the empty tomb. It is on this journey that you and I are reminded that we are enabled and empowered to be people of grace and love, first and foremost, because we are people who have been formed by God's love, mercy, and grace as represented in the cross of Jesus Christ. And it's on this journey and in this text, this particular text we've heard Wallace read to us this morning, that we find a very compelling, a very powerful call back to our Ebenezer, to our roots, to our identity. In this text, the Apostle Paul makes it pretty clear where the source of our identity is. It's in a very powerful, simple theological truth. Our identity is to be found in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. In other words, we are people of the cross. Or if you like, we're cross people. Your choice. Now that may sound uncomplicated. It may, may sound not very controversial at all. What's a big deal, Ken? We know that. But take a closer look at that. Richard Carlson, in commentary on this particular text, wrote this. He said the cross was a pretty lousy marketing tool for the first century world, much like it remains for the 21st century world. The cross was the means of capital punishment executed by Rome on the worst in their society. It was a method of torture and death used to bring pain and humiliation before, during, and even after the death of the condemned. Given this reality, it is sheer idiocy, not just mere foolishness, to consider how the cross might be a method of divine revelation. 
in this world where today, even still, might makes right. In this world where being on the right, the winning team, is the sure sign of being right, that's not a real ringing endorsement, is it? And yet, the Apostle Paul is insistent that our identity as disciples and as a church is rooted in this powerful truth of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. This is our basis, our genesis, and our identity. And everything else of our witness, of our mission, and of our vision flows from this powerful truth. With that in mind, let me ask you this morning. Who do you think you are? Now, I'm not talking about your denominational or your local church affiliation. I want to know where is your source of grounding as a disciple? What is our source of grounding as the church? What makes us tick, if you will? What is the source for our vision and our mission individually and as a church? We need to know that. Looking at this text, the Apostle Paul shows us very plainly the true source of our identity as disciples of the church. It's not grounded in that which is popular. It's not grounded in that which is popular. In the Corinthian mission field, there were Jewish persons who regarded this message of Jesus and the cross as scandalous. According to Jewish thought, anyone who died on the cross was considered to be accursed, to be removed from the possibility of God's mercy. And so the very idea that Messiah would die on the cross was scandalous. The Messiah was going to come, he was going to be a conquering hero. He was going to make them number one again. He wasn't going to be a humble peasant carpenter who was going to be executed by the Romans for sedition. As they looked at it, it seemed like the only people falling victim to this, believing this story, were just the least last and lost among the people around them. All the really best people realized that this Christian message was something that was threatening their way of life. I mean, the very idea of somebody telling you you have to die in order to live. That you have to give away all, to give all, in order to have all. That you've got to follow this Nazarene and his troop of merry followers. It's scandalous. It's very unpopular. And the message was greeted with a good deal of hate and derision. I'm here to tell you this morning, brothers and sisters, the message of the cross is still unpopular today. For many people in our world this morning, and some even in churches. Their sense of identity in a spiritual sense has to be rooted in something that is palatable to them and acceptable to the world around them. In a July 2014 article, New Republic editor Leon Weisenfelter and his assistant Molly Warder Decided they would take up a discussion and a study of the idea of a custom-built faith, something I love, what they call cafeteria spirituality. They said they would talk about this at the Aspen Idea <coughs> Festival in Colorado, and they did. And as they conducted this discussion and this study, where the road, there's a problem with the hyper-individualized faith of millennial religion. The good thing about an orthodox faith is that it causes you to deal with hard truths that you might otherwise try to avoid. It reminds you that you have something to learn from the millennia of people who came before you. To this, Weisenfelder added, Important truths are being forgotten because Americans are insisting that their religion be as customized as their shopping experiences. That's a real danger to anybody who wants to abandon the true identity of the gospel for the sake of something that's much more palatable, much more acceptable. You see, people, they don't want to hear about sin. That's a, that's a, that's a word they don't want to hear. They want to hear sermons about 
seven steps to being a happier, more fulfilled person. How to be wealthier. If we're good people, that's enough. And if we'll just be good, then everything will be all right. We love everybody. That's it. Well, it flies in the face of the message of the cross that tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the only way for us to make it right again is to accept God's free gift of grace for us on Calvary's tree. That's not a very popular message in a lot of quarters this morning. But you know what? Our identity is not based on the message that's popular in those quarters. Our identity doesn't come from the popular. We're not a pole driven religion, how's that? Nor is our identity grounded in the pleasantry of theory. You see, Paul spent a lot of time among Gentiles. He was able to convert a lot of Gentiles. But it was not always easy. There were a lot of them, particularly Greeks, who were people of logic and reason. And for them, the idea of a faith meant to be lived, to be experienced, was just, they didn't make good sense. To them, God is apathetic. He's apathetic, far removed from the human condition. God couldn't be incarnate. He couldn't be one of us. God is a topic of discussion for us to sit around the coffee shop and talk about and speculate. The idea that God would not only come and be one of us, but die for us? Well, that just doesn't make good sense. It's not logical. And so this was treated with a great deal of derision by many in Paul's day. In a November 6, 2006 article in Time Magazine, David Van Veen talks about a discussion that took place between Christian scientist Francis Collins and noted atheist professor Richard Dawkins. In this discussion, Dawkins actually went as far as to admit the intellectual and theoretical possibility of the existence of a God, something that he said was refutable, and yet it was big enough and grand enough to be worthy of respect. But he went on to say, the thought of Jesus coming and dying on a cross, I don't think is worthy of that grandeur. If there is a God, it's going to be something far bigger and far more inexplicable than we realize. Well, the problem with Professor Dawkins and with all of those who want to reduce the Christian faith to little more than theoretical calisthenics is this. They've overlooked one very simple thing. They've overlooked incarnation. Incarnation. You see, in Jesus, God got personal. God came to us as one of us. And on the cross we see the full expression of God's love and mercy and grace. Made flesh, made evident to us. You have to understand God is not interested in being a topic for our coffee time discussion. He wants to walk with us, talk with us, transform us. Be in relationship with us. There are folks who think it's all up here, but it's here too. Our identity is not found in the pleasantries of theory. We have to look to Paul. Paul reminds us that our identity is grounded in the power of God as revealed in the cross of Jesus. In the message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, we find something that may not be popular and it may not be pleasing in an intellectual sense, but it is the power that is able to save you and I for abundant living here and eternal life to come. He tells us that the crucifixion is the power of God to those who are being saved. And our greatest hope in this world today as we try to escape this culture of death is to cling to that cross despite those who would try to dissuade us. In her book, The God Among the Cross, 
Author Ellen Vaughn tells a very powerful story of how a village in northern Cambodia came to a saving knowledge of Jesus. In 1999, an evangelist went into that particular region of Cambodia to preach the gospel. There weren't many people up there anyway, but many of those who were up there were Buddhists or otherwise were some sort of a spiritualist. They really didn't know much about Christianity. However, when this evangelist went into one particular village, he was warmly greeted and the message he proclaimed was warmly received and many came to a saving knowledge of Jesus. When the evangelist asked the people in the village, why were you so receptive to me? Why were you so warm and receptive to this message? An elderly lady in the crowd stepped forward and said, we have been waiting for you to come for 20 years. She went on to tell a very powerful story of an experience they had 20 years earlier in the village. In 1979, soldiers from the Khmer Rouge regime came into this village, told the villagers to proceed to dig your own grave, we're gonna kill you, dig your grave. As they dug their graves, many lifted up their cries and lamentations. Some cried to Buddha, others cried to family spirits. However, there was one woman in the crowd who remembered a story from her childhood, a story her mother had told her about a God who had hung on a cross. And she began to lift up her cry of lamentation to this God, thinking surely he would understand, surely he would come to our help. And as she cried, others began to hear her, and they began to lift their cry up as well. And soon all of them were crying to this God who died all on the cross, who hung on the cross. When they finished, they turned to face those men who were going to kill them, only to discover the soldiers had all disappeared. The God who hung on the cross saved them that day. The woman went on to say, for 20 years, we've been waiting for somebody to come and tell us the rest of the story about the God who hung on the cross. That same power is coursing through the message of the cross today. That same power is there in that message. This cross still saves for abundant living here and eternal living to come. And that's why this cross is the only thing worthy to be the source of our identity. It's the only truth worthy to be that by which we are called and ranked. Max Lucado in his book, The Cross, says of the cross that it sits on the timeline of history like a beautiful diamond no longer has ever been more sanctified. He said, no wonder that the cross of Christ is seen by the Apostle Paul as the core of the gospel. <coughs> its bottom line is powerful. It is the linchpin and the hinge of history. Period. So once again, on this beautiful Lenten Sunday morning, I ask you, who do you think you are? According to the Apostle Paul, we are cross people. We are people whose identity is shaped and formed <coughs> and rooted deeply in the powerful message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Of course, that's what the Apostle Paul says. But how about you? Thanks, <coughs> Amen. Let the church say amen. Amen. As we continue in worship, I want to just take a quick moment for us to spend some time in prayer. Um, most of the time, someone stands up here on the stage and prays on your behalf. But uh, this morning, during worship rehearsal, we realized that it would be really strange for you to go to somebody's house and not speak to them. 
if I went, if I came to your house and I said I'm going to eat your food and I'm going to hang out and watch TV and play your Xbox or whatever, but I don't actually want to talk to you, you know, that would be okay. This is God's house. And I just realized that it was so strange for all of us, for all of you to be here this morning and not speak to him yourselves. So we're just going to take a little bit of time. We're getting ready to sing a song called None But Jesus. And we're just going to hang out uh, for just a, a couple of minutes. Derek is going to give us some, some background noise. And uh, I want you to go to God in prayer. I want you to speak to him yourself. And if you need something to focus your prayer, there's a line in this song that we're getting ready to sing that says, I live to bring you praise. And so I want you to speak to the Lord, and I want you to ask him, what areas of your life are you bringing him praise in? What areas of your life are you not bringing him praise? Let's go to the Lord in prayer for the one.
live to bring him praise. It is because of Jesus that we're alive at all. It's because of Jesus that we're able to stand here and lift our voices to him. So why don't we close by singing a song called All Because of Jesus? What do you say? Amen. This is a fast one. For me.